The rest of this chapter is going to be largely focused on what we're going to call electronic structure. Up to this point we've looked at atomic structure. So we've looked at where are the protons and the neutrons and where are the electrons. And all we've said about electrons so far is that they're outside the nucleus and they're kind of sort of orbiting the nucleus in a way. We're now going to focus just on these electrons. So we know based on a lot of evidence that the electrons are going to be outside of the nucleus in what we're going to call specific energy levels and we also use the word shells. In our mind it's probably a good idea to visualize these as being like orbits of planets around the Sun. That is not an accurate analogy but it probably makes it easier for you to see in your head. However, the one level of accuracy of that is that the higher the energy level, the further away the electrons spend their time on average. So using our fairly poor solar system analogy, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, so Mercury's orbit would be similar to say to energy level 1, and then the next planet out would be Venus, so that would be in a way similar to energy level 2 because it's spending its time further away. However, it's not a perfectly good description because uh, that's only telling us where the electron can probably be found. Whereas with planets, we know where they can be found. That's definite. There's no question. So please note these terms mean the same thing. Now in most cases, with some exceptions that we see, electrons fill up the lower energy levels first and then any additional electrons will go into the next higher energy levels and fill them. So it's basically like hotel rooms where you fill certain rooms before you can fill others. When the electrons are all in their lowest possible energy state for a particular atom, we say that that atom is in its ground state. Now when we add energy to an atom, so light or heat, and we're going to be doing this in one of the experiments by using flames, what happens is the atom can use that energy to push its electrons out from a lower energy level to a higher one. So for example, helium, its electrons are only in the first energy level, as we'll find out. Those can be pushed out to energy level 2 or energy level 3 or further. And when that happens, we say that the atom is excited. So atoms, when they are excited, are unstable. They have too much energy. And that energy cannot just disappear. There's a very important law called the Law of Conservation of Energy, which says that you cannot create or destroy energy. So that energy has to be released in some way. And the way it does that, in a uh, typical fashion, is to shoot off the energy as light. And we can call that light a quanta, an energy packet, but we're usually going to use the better term photon, not to be confused with proton. So the excited electrons return back to their positions in the lower energy level. Now those photons have a different wavelength associated with them from atom to atom. And so that means that they can be different EM radiation. Some of them might correspond to red light, some of them might correspond to blue light, some of it might be ultraviolet, and some of it might be infrared. Here's an illustration of this process from a different book than your own. So imagine here we have our nucleus in the middle. This is meant to represent an energy level and remember it would go completely around in our model just like it was an orbit. And this symbol here is meant to represent a photon. It's a clever little symbol because it's showing it like a particle and it's also showing that it has a wavelength. It actually is both things at once. So when this atom absorbs energy from light or from heating it, that electron jumps to a further out energy level where it spends more of its time away from the nucleus. That is an excited atom. 
it then has to get rid of that energy and so as the electron falls back to its usual position it shoots off that electron that uh, energy as a photon and so we call that emission more terms that we need to be very careful about so as I've said several times electrons don't just rotate around the nucleus in a very simple pattern instead a more accurate description would be to say that electrons are contained in orbitals for the most part which are volumes of space in which you are likely to find the electron there are four common types of orbitals in chemistry and we're going to call those orbitals by the names s p d and f and these tell us the different types of shapes that these orbitals are going to have and they're listed generally in order from lowest energy to highest let's get a little bit more in detail with these a very important rule to know is that any one orbital s p d or f it doesn't matter but an orbital can hold up to two electrons so that means an orbital could be empty and have zero electrons it could be half full and have one electron or it can have two electrons in which case it's totally full now every shell has a very predictable number of each type of orbital so for example except for the first shell all the other shells shell two three on up have exactly three p orbitals so we classify these sets of orbitals as what we call a subshell so a p subshell has three orbitals in it and we call those three p orbitals and so the way we label these three p orbitals is we say that they are part of the two p subshell the two is the shell or the energy level 2p is the subshell so then let's say we go out to the next energy level or shell so in shell 3 we have three more p orbitals and we call that the 3p subshell and then in the fourth we have the 4p subshell etc so again this is not a perfectly accurate picture because we're showing these shells as being like perfect circles but it's a good way to keep it in our head to keep things simple so it turns out the first shell or energy level only has one subshell and that the name of that is 1s so electrons can be in the 1s subshell on the second shell electrons can be in a 2s subshell or they can be in a 2p subshell and remember these subshells are made up of things called orbitals starting with the third shell we have s p and d subshells and their names are 3s 3p 3d and then the fourth shell would be 4s 4p 4d 4f now life would be easy for us if we could say that electrons go into 1s then they go into 2s and they go into 2p and that the order just goes perfectly like this but it turns out that's not how this works out electrons are going to want to go where they have the lowest energy first and sometimes there's some jumping around to make that work out as we'll see in one moment so let's talk about s orbitals and s subshells for right now so we said that s orbitals are the least energetic of all the different orbitals and it's shaped as a sphere so it's the most simple looking of all of the different types of orbitals all of the energies have exactly one s orbital in them s subshells always have a single s orbital remember we said that any orbital can only hold two electrons so if an s subshell has only one orbital that means how many electrons can it hold it can hold up to two and once it's at two it's maxed out okay. 
this is a nice image for understanding the concept of what an orbital is. I want you to imagine if it were possible to take pictures of electrons as they moved about atoms. Each one of these spots would indicate a place where the electron was during a picture. Now you might think that they're just going around and around like this, but no, it's much more complicated. The electron might be there one instant, it might be there one instant, it could be there one instant, it could be there one instant. Even using the word there isn't really accurate. Electrons aren't there in the way that you and I are in a certain place. It's, it's a much more complicated phenomenon. So if we're taking pictures of where the electrons are residing, you see that the electrons tend to spend most of their time close to the nucleus, not actually in the nucleus, but fairly close. And you'll see that the dots are getting further and further spread out here, showing that they're less and less likely to be out here at any point in time. Could the electron be way out here? And the answer is sure, it could be way out there. It's just very unlikely at any point in time. Okay, so this is just showing a picture which shows that there's many less dots on the outside than there are on the inside. And so rather than drawing the pictures really complicated like this, we usually draw the pictures of orbitals just like this right here. It's a three-dimensional sphere which says that the electrons are mostly going to be inside there. Remember how many electrons could fit inside this sphere? It's an s orbital and orbitals can only hold two electrons. So two electrons could be here at any one point in time. Now we look at p orbitals. So there are no p subshells on the first level. The first energy level we set or the first shell only has a 1s subshell. Be careful. As I said, the terminology can get very confusing at this section. So say we're at the second shell, second energy level. Every one of those levels from 2 on out has a 2p has a p subshell and p subshells always have 3 orbitals in them and we call those the p orbitals. Now remember we said that an orbital is a region in space that can hold up to 2 electrons. So a p subshell always has three orbitals in it. So that means three times two, you can get up to six electrons in any of the p subshells. So the two p subshell can hold six electrons. The three p subshell, six electrons. The one p subshell, there's no such thing. Remember we said only starting with two. So the p orbitals, it turns out, have a more complex shape. The s orbitals were spherical and that made them easy to interpret. The p orbitals, on the other hand, can look kind of strange here. Here's one way of representing them. Here's another way of representing exactly the same thing. So this is just two different ways of drawing the same picture. This picture here in the middle is the more common way of showing an orbital. So this whole thing here is a p orbital. That's not an orbital and that's not an orbital. The whole picture here is an orbital. So how many electrons can fit in here? Up to two. There's no rule saying that one has to be down here and one has to be up there. Although at any point in time it's more likely that they would be in different uh, lobes, we call those lobes right there, but both electrons could be up here, both electrons could be here, and remember both electrons could be over here somewhere. This is just telling us where we are most likely uh, about 95% of the time to find the electrons. This plane right here you don't need to worry about, but it's called a node. A node is a region in space where the electron is forbidden to be. So you might ask yourself, well, if the electron can be above the plane and below the plane, but it can never be in the plane, how is that possible? And I'll say that's a great question, and I'm not going to say anything more than that. It's very, very complicated. What would we call this picture then? Well, we already know this thing here. We said this was an orbital, and it's on the z-axis here. 
So what about this right here? This is another orbital. And what about here? This is another orbital. Remember I said that P subshells always have three orbitals. So we call this whole thing a subshell. It is an orbital here, plus an orbital here along this y-axis, plus an orbital here along the z-axis. I know many of you have probably never even seen a z-axis, but it's just like algebra where we have an x-axis and a y-axis, but now we have an axis coming straight out in space at us. Well, if you thought P was complicated, wait until you see DNF. Well, the great thing about DNF is we don't really need to know almost anything about them other than just some numbers here. So remember we said we don't start getting P orbitals until the second shell. We don't start getting D orbitals until the third shell. So energy levels three and higher. And they always come instead of in sets of three, they come in sets of five. So how many electrons can be held here? five orbitals, so five times two electrons per orbital would be ten. We don't start getting electrons in f orbitals until we get to shell four and higher. It's kind of like in a video game, you're leveling up. As you get higher and higher, you get access to more and more subshells and they come in sets of seven. Now there's been a simple pattern here. The s orbitals always came in sets of one, so every s subshell has one orbital. p's had three, d's have five, and f have seven. That's just the odd numbers. So s is one, p is three, d is five, f is seven. And so how many electrons can that hold? Well, remember, each orbital can hold up to two electrons, so if you have seven orbitals, seven times two would be 14 electrons. So let's take a look at this rather bizarre picture here. Uh, don't look at B for right now. Look at C, D, E, F, and G. These are what those orbitals look like. And you'll notice the shapes get more and more complicated, especially this one here, which has kind of a funky donut right around the nucleus of the atom. If we took all five pictures here, C, D, E, F, and G, and put them on top of each other, we'd end up with this picture H, which is the subshell. This is the 3D subshell. How many electrons in here? Remember, two electrons can be in here, two electrons can be in here, two, to 2, so this would be a total of 2 times 5, or 10 electrons can live in these orbitals. The f orbitals get even more complicated, and we're not going to look at those in any depth. Here's what one of the possible f orbitals look like. There are six more, and we're not going to worry about those. If you're curious, you can go out on the internet and search f orbitals to see what they look like. We're going to now tie all of this together with what we call the electron configurations. So the simplest way to describe an electron configuration is to say that this is essentially the address of all the electrons in an atom. So each element is going to have a unique electron configuration and that tells us which subshells have electrons in them and how many. So let's look for example at boron. If you look on your periodic table, boron B has five protons. Therefore, it should have five electrons if it's neutral. The electrons are going to fill in a very specific order. You will always fill the 1s subshell first. We said that s subshells have only one orbital in them, so you can only get two electrons in there and it's full. So when I look at this, I read it as the 1s subshell has two electrons. The 2s subshell, so we're now on the second shell, s's can only get up to two electrons, so we have two electrons there. So now we've accounted for four of our electrons. And then finally, because we're on the second shell, we can get a p subshell, 
and P's can hold up to 6. Remember though we said we had only 5 electrons so we've already accounted for 4 of them so 2P1 means that there's one electron, the leftover, in the 2P subshell. So here we have it broken down into words. The rule for filling the subshells is we always fill them in order from lowest energy to highest energy. Imagine, if you will, being in different rooms gave you different amounts of energy. You know, there was like caffeine floating around in the air. So the calmest subshell would be 1s. The next calmest would be 2s. And we're always going to fill from those lowest energies to the highest. That does not mean that we always fill in order from closest to the nucleus to farther. That's usually true, but not always. So the order in which they fill can be found on the periodic table. And what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to divide the periodic table into four blocks. And if we take a look at this diagram here, it shows how these blocks are laid out. So if you'll notice, with the exception of the first period of the periodic table, this whole column over here on the periodic table is exactly two elements wide. You'll see two boxes. So for example, you've got hydrogen here. This box would actually be over there for helium. And then we have lithium and beryllium. And then if you look on the periodic table down here, you have sodium. And so this whole area here, we call these elements in these two columns the S block. And you'll notice it's, as I said a second ago, two columns wide. How many electrons can we fill in an S subshell? Two. That's not a coincidence. Over here, all of these atoms are said to reside in what we call the uh, P block. And how many electrons can go into a P subshell? Six. Again, not a coincidence that if we look at these uh, boxes here, if we were to count from all these different elements across, so starting from boron, carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, that would be six elements across there. So again, not a coincidence. The periodic table is very much arranged to take that into account. Helium normally would appear over here, but we want to think of helium as being in the S block, uh, so it's kind of one important exception to the way this is going to work. And then down here we have what is called the D block, the transition metals are the D block and then the inner transition metals are the F block. So uh, the way that these are going to fill, you always fill up 1s first. So hydrogen, the electron configuration, is 1s1. Helium, which is technically over here, but we'll leave it here for right now, is 1s2. Helium has two electrons, so the electron configuration is 1s2. Once you've filled 1s, because S's cannot have more than two electrons in a subshell, you then are just going to step down to the next level. So you then fill 2S, and 2S can hold up to two electrons. Once that's filled, you go over and you fill 2P. Once that's filled, you're just following the atomic numbers. So right from here, you go right to row 3. So then the 3S and now here's going to be a, a distinction. 3s, 3p, what about 3d? No, not quite. This is going to be weird. So 3s, 3p, 4s, and then we go back into the core of the atom to fill 3d. Remember, we're not doing this necessarily in order from closest to the nucleus to farthest not all the way through. We're doing this in order of lowest energy to highest energy and it just so happens that the f electrons in 4s will have less energy than electrons in 3d but just barely. So after we fill 3d we go into 4p and then the rest of the pattern should make sense here 5s, 4d, 5p. We run into a bit of a hiccup down here uh, because after 6s, if you notice how the periodic table is laid out, it seems like you start to fill up the 5d's and then it's like the 5d's lose interest and you skip down to the 4f's. 
and that makes electron configurations that are very strange. Uh, but I don't need you to know the electron configurations of any of the elements uh, that end in 4f or end in 5f. So I want us to just consider the order as if it goes from 6s and then just go right on down 4f back up 5d 6p then 7s and then skip down 5f 6d 7p. A few other things to note about this diagram. You'll notice that for the s block elements and the p block elements the subshell that you're filling is exactly the same as the period number. So row 1 uh, you're filling 1s row 2, 2s, 2p, 3, 3s, 3p, 4 is 4s and 4p. You'll notice that these though are always one behind. So if you're in row 4, period 4, this is going to be the 3d's. In period 5 it's the 4d's. The f's are always two behind. So 4f is actually in row 6. Not row, uh, so it's not 6f, it's just 4f. And then in row 7, we have the 5Fs, because again, these would fit right here in the periodic table. So let's do some examples here. So I'd like you to determine the electron configurations for each of the following atoms or ions. So beryllium, nitrogen, sodium, vanadium, and iodine. So you'll want to be sure to write those down if you haven't done so already. And I'm going to go one slide forward, assuming you've written these, to show you a periodic table. And I need you to then pause the video and make sure to attempt all of these electron configurations. If you're getting stuck, then go ahead and unpause it and say watch one or the other and then go ahead and attempt to try to finish from there. So here's the periodic table and you'll want to pause the video and fill out those electron configurations. Okay, I'm assuming that you had paused, so let's take a look at some of the answers here. So, first of all, let's go ahead and take a look at beryllium. The electron configuration of beryllium is 1s2 2s2. Let's see if we can figure out why. Here's beryllium. It's in the second period, so you always fill 1s first, and s's can get up to two electrons. So lithium would then be 2s1, beryllium would be 2s2. So really what you're doing is you're focusing on finding uh, the position of the last element. So if our element is, is in s2, so that's what it's going to end with. We just fill everything until we get to 2s2. How about nitrogen? Nitrogen we have to fill up 1s2 and 2s2, but then we go three more boxes further into 2p3. Here is nitrogen. So 1s has two electrons, 2s has two electrons, and then nitrogen, 2p1, p2, p3. So it's going to be ending in 2p3. Oxygen would have ended in 2p4, fluorine in 2p5, neon in 2p6. You'll notice that all of these elements here end in something p1. All of these elements here end in something p2, like carbon would end in 2p2, silicon would end in 3p2, germanium in 4p2. next element that we wanted to do was sodium and its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Here is sodium. So we've already seen we fill 1s with two electrons, 2s with two electrons, 2p with six electrons, and then here's our three s's. We only fill one electron, so 3s1. While we're here, let's just go ahead and do the next element, vanadium. So we've already seen it begins with 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Then we have 
3s2. We're trying to get to vanadium. And then we'll go to the end, so just zip to the end. That would be 3p6. Go to the next row, zip to calcium. 4s2. And now remember, these are the 3d's. So 4s2, 3d1, 2, 3. 3d3. So there is the complete electron configuration for vanadium. Finally, let's take a look at iodine. So iodine starts the same way. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, all the way up to here where we are. And I'm just going to go ahead and pull up the full configuration. So 4s2. So we fill the 3d10s and 4p6. We then go to the next uh, period on the table and we get 5s2, 4d10, 5p5. Now, I would bet that by the time you got to iodine, you were finding this to be rather tedious and unexciting. And so do most of us, and that's why we have a shortcut notation. So let's talk about doing this in a shortcut. So this is how we are going to do that. So let's go back to vanadium, which we just did a moment ago. What you do is you go backwards to the last noble gas that you passed on the periodic table. So in the case of vanadium, if you go backwards, just like this is a board game, until you got to the last noble gas, it was argon, element 18. So what we just do is we write that noble gas inside square brackets, and it always has to be a noble gas, and we just start the configuration from there. So after argon, it's 4s2, 3d3. Let's do this now for antimony. And antimony has symbol SB. SB. Uh, before I look at antimony, which is over here, SB, just a reminder again on vanadium. We had said we went back to argon. So starting after argon, it's 4s2 and 3p, excuse me, 3d3. And remember, the noble gases are the elements in column 8a. So we said we wanted to do antimony. So to do antimony, what's the last noble gas you went through? Da, 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 da. Krypton. So krypton was your last noble gas. So starting from krypton, we go to 5s2, 4d10, and then 5p123. So you'll notice that these are very, very close. So it took a lot to write out the electric configuration of iodine. Antimony is the same as iodine, except that antimony ended in uh, 5p3 and iodine ended in 5p5. But using this shortcut notation really makes things much, much easier on us. And so there it is, the shortcut notation for antimony. The last topic I want to cover is uh, an important topic for understanding the next chapter, chapter 3, and it's uh, focus on bonding. And so we want to know what valence electrons are. So there is a term that we need. The valence shell is going to be the outermost shell of any atom that has electrons in it. So the valence electrons are the electrons in that shell. And then any other electrons are called core electrons. An atom can get up to eight valence electrons. And so uh, that's going to be a very special number, the number eight, uh, when we get to the next chapter. And knowing the number of valence electrons any atom has is easily the most important information you're going to need to figure out how that atom will react chemically. Now, the valence electrons are not always the electrons with the highest energy, as we can see with transition metals. Remember how we skipped from 4s to 3d? 
Well, in those cases, if electrons were in 3D, those are inside the atom, whereas the 4s are still on the outside. So let's look at two atoms here. And again, we're using our not very good planetary model, but I think it makes it easier to see here. So here's our nucleus. 3p means that the nucleus has three protons in it for lithium. And then we fill in, let's let these dots represent electrons. So in the first shell, we have two electrons, right? These are in 1s. Once that shell is full, you go out to the next shell. So you fill 2s. But lithium only has three electrons, so that's where that is. So for lithium, we would say the valence shell is shell number two. These electrons here are core electrons. And most important, lithium has one valence electron. What about sodium? Sodium is right beneath lithium in the periodic table. Even though it has a lot more electrons, you'll notice that both lithium and sodium have only one valence electron. The difference is that the valence shell for sodium is shell number three. And so what sodium does have a lot more of are core electrons. And that's not going to really make much of a difference here because core electrons aren't going to be the ones that engage in the bonding. It's going to be the valence electrons that are important. So we'll find out that lithium and sodium have a lot of similarities. For example, if you put these in water, they both react explosively, especially sodium. So there's a nice trick for figuring out how many valence electrons an atom has. All you have to do is look at the group number. So group 1a, group 2a, all the way through group 8a. The number of valence electrons the atom has is just its group number. That's it. So phosphorus is in group 5a, and it has five valence electrons. The only exception that's important for us to know is helium. Helium, remember, has only two electrons, period. There are no more electrons. So even though it's in group 8a, there's no way it could have eight valence electrons. So helium has two. And so if we wanted to look here, we can see how these all work out. In group one, all of these elements have one valence electron. In group 2a, they all have two valence electrons etc. And the only exception here being helium in group 8a only has two valence electrons, whereas all the elements beneath it has eight valence electrons. I'm going to go ahead and end here. This is the end of chapter two. When we come back and look at chapter three, we'll be getting into the details of chemical bonding. Thank you.